Good morning and welcome to virtual breakfast. Um, my name is Christine. I am a new educator out in the southwest part of the state, so I'm excited to be with everybody here today. So without further ado, I'll be introducing Dr. Aaron Hill with the Plant and Pest Diagnostics um, at MSU, and we'll get started with her uh, presentation. Well, good morning, Christine and everybody, and uh, thank you for introducing me. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab that we have here on MSU's campus in East Lansing. And I think the important point as we go over all the services that we offer is that it's really critical to understand when you're having problems with your crops or other plants in the field, what is going on so that you can address the situation appropriately um, and avoid you know, um, unnecessary applications or actions um, that might not actually help you solve the problem. And so uh, I think the theme sort of also is that we're here for you and we just want to highlight the services that we have. Um, I know some of you may not be able to see photos on your uh, device this morning, so I will do my best to describe them. But a lot of um, diagnostics is very visual. And so I think I have um, some nice photos to share if you do have the opportunity opportunity to safely uh, check those out on your screen. The first one here, as you can see, is that I've taken the typical virtual breakfast background and I've um, made the diagnostic version of it. So there's all kinds of plant problems going on here with our corn, wheat, soybeans, and alfalfa. So uh, just to give you an introduction to diagnostics um, as a whole, we are not an island unto ourselves. Here I'm showing a map of the United States and I'm showing all of the many, many locations of diagnostic labs across the US. And um, there are, are just uh, a lot of us, many of us are housed at land grant institutions. There are also some um, industry labs that participate in the National Plant Diagnostic Network. Um, and so we have a lot of resources even beyond Michigan that we can pull from a lot of expertise. Um, and these other labs, MSU's Diagnostic Lab is one of the regional hubs. We represent the North Central region. Um, and um, I think we're pretty fortunate. We have a, a pretty large capacity um, to handle samples compared to some of our counterparts. Uh, our lab is largely funded by Project Green and the income that our samples generate. Uh, also, I won't have much time to talk about that, but four of the six people that work in our lab have teaching appointments, and so that is also a factor in um, some of our funding for our personnel. Every year, the uh, MSU Diagnostic Lab handles over 4,000 physical samples. Um, those are things that get mailed in or dropped off to the lab, um, but we handle many times more than that in digital samples that we each receive via email and also that we handle um, a few of us participate in ask extension. I'm now showing a pie chart if you are able to see it that shows the breakdown of the um, cropping systems that are represented by the samples that we get each year. So out of those 4,000 samples, um, nearly half of them come from field crop scenarios. Um, and then we all, but we get um, samples that come from all sectors of agriculture in Michigan and beyond. And we also um, get many uh, residential uh, type samples and, and other types of samples that you might not think of anywhere. Plants are growing. It's possible that we've had a plant submitted uh, to the diagnostic lab. This next pie chart is uh, just showing the caseload that we receive by month and we are open year round. Uh, we receive samples every month of the year. As you would imagine, the winter time is a bit slower, but Michigan has the third largest greenhouse industry in the country. And so we are um, helping service that community largely during those winter months. Uh, things are really picking up here. As you can see in May, we're typically getting over 300 samples a month. And then June, July, August, and September even, um, we're seeing sometimes close to 700 samples a month. Um, so that's, that's a lot of samples that are coming in. Um, the FedEx and uh, mail people are dropping stuff off pretty regularly, as well as people just dropping things by our building. So what is it that we're doing with these 4,000 plus samples a year? Uh, well, 
our group here is basically uh, a group of plant detectives. And I think that makes our job a little bit uh, exciting because every day is different and every case and every plant that quote unquote walks through that door um, has a different story behind it. And uh, there are six people that work full time in our lab. Um, and I'll talk about them a little bit. And then our director is Ray Hammerschmidt. So he's sort of the, the seventh person. Um, but with such a large diagnostic lab, we are able to have expertise in the various uh, plant pest disciplines. And uh, we are lucky that we have so many people that we can uh, be laser focused in our area uh, while also working together. Many of our other diagnostic lab counterparts may have two or three full-time personnel. Um, and so they may be classically trained as a plant pathologist, but they are having to cover other areas as well. Um, and here we, we can really focus. I would say collectively, um, the people who are here, we have about 125 years of expertise working in diagnostics between us. Um, and so uh, that that's really nice. and. Um, I really enjoy working with all of these people. Um, so the areas that we specialize in are plant identification, and that's something that I um, work on along with Angie Tenney. We also have Howard Russell, who is our bug man. He specializes in um, arthropod identification. So insects, mites, ticks, other things like that. Um, and also he can look at plants to see if there is injury. Um, from any type of arthropod um, or insect. We have uh, Jan Byrne, who is our lead pathologist um, and works on pathogen identification. Um, and she is supported by uh, Laura Miles, who is also a plant pathologist. Um, and her specialty is bringing molecular tools to the lab and keeping us on the cutting edge of new diagnostic techniques. Um, Angie Tenney is our nematologist, and so she's the one that's handling um, pretty close to half of those 4,000 samples are actually nematode samples. So Angie stays quite busy, uh, and she's following up from her predecessor, Fred Warner. Um, but Angie's been here for quite some time, and, and the transition has gone very smoothly. Um, sometimes the plants that come to our lab don't have um, a biological explanation or uh, uh, entity that is causing the problem, and it's an abiotic problem. And so we all kind of work together on that, and that is one of the areas I would say that I specialize in uh, as a weed scientist, particularly when it comes to chemical injury situations. And then the other thing that we are allowed able to offer because we have a weed scientist is a herbicide resistance screening in weeds. And so we are one of the few labs that can offer that service um, here. One thing that I wanted to point out quickly that we do not do is soil testing. We can test soil for pH and soluble salts or EC, um, but we are not a soil testing lab. And so um, there are other avenues that you can go through if that is what you're interested in. But that's one of the number one questions we get asked about lately, especially with the lab on campus closing. Um, and so I just figured I would, I would throw that out there. So now we're gonna talk about sort of the process um, and how you can submit a sample. So one of the most important things that um, I think gets forgotten is that we are, we are in the lab and we can see the plant material that you send to us and we can run tests and analysis on that. But sometimes um, just that plant, it doesn't tell the whole story. And so when you're out collecting a sample, it's really critical that you share with us some on-site photos um, so we can um, see what's going on beyond just those plants. So here I'm showing a picture of a cornfield, both up close the plants in the row and then sort of a more broad picture of corn that is not doing so well. So while we may have the corn plants in the lab, the corn plants can't tell us that there's a woodlot off to the right hand side. They can't tell us that there's an adjacent field on the other side that's a different crop. It can't tell us that there's a lot of uh, grassy dead residue on the soil. Um, there's a lot of things that just the plants when they come to us don't tell us about the scenario. They can't tell us the pattern that's presented in the field. And so those uh, sample or those photos 
that can be emailed to us are really, really helpful. And ultimately, we'll cut down on some of the questions we have to come back to you with um, if you send them up front. The next thing that is very important when submitting a sample is that you fully complete the uh, form that we have on our website, and we'll make sure that the website gets posted in the chat. But um, there are a few different forms. This is our general form. The form, um, first and foremost, tells us who is submitting the sample and who wants to receive both the results and the bill. Um, and so we need to have that information. Um, and, and once we have these forms, we create a case number for you within our system. Um, you need to specify, like I said, who is going to be receiving the invoice, um, unless it's one of our sponsored programs, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, the bottom two thirds of this form is asking for details about the scenario where the plants um, or the soil came from. It's asking you about the type of plants, the location, when the symptoms occurred, what the patterns are, the type of planting, and so on and so forth. A lot of times we get our samples and this form is not fully completed, um, particularly the chemical history. And so we have to follow up with questions. So in order to save us time and get your results back to you in a more timely fashion, we suggest that you fill out as much of this form as you can when you submit it with your sample. Um, the next part, of course, would be collecting and packaging your physical sample. Some people may be dropping it off, so it doesn't require as much care with packaging. Um, but if you're sending it through the mail, definitely you want to visit our website where we have detailed instructions based on the type of sample you're submitting. So there are going to be separate instructions if you're submitting an insect versus a nematode sample. Um, versus a whole plant health analysis sample where we want the entire plant with the roots attached. Here I'm going to show several photos, so I'll do my best to describe what I'm showing here. This, this picture is showing in one hand uh, a single leaf. I believe that this is a hops plant, and then the other hand it is um, more of the complete plant. Not It doesn't have the roots, but when we have a sample that's submitted uh, a bag of individual leaves, is not very helpful because it doesn't show us the distribution of the injury on the plant. Um, and so in this case, more is always better. Um, and I'd just like to point that out. This next pictures I'm showing, um, they have emojis on them showing something that's very good at versus something that's very bad. Um, this is something that I posted on our lab's Twitter account, but um, on the left-hand side, I'm showing two examples uh, of wheat sample, and it has plants that are showing the symptoms from this wheat field that are complete with their above and below ground components and soil. And they also submitted some plants from that field that are not showing symptoms. And so this is the ideal situation when you have um, symptomatic plants where it is not the whole field that is impacted because then we can compare apples to apples per se, right? So we're looking at the same cultivar of wheat. We're looking at what it should look like or versus what it does look like in these injured areas. And that can um, enhance our story. Also, if we end up sending any of this tissue or soil for nutrient analysis, we have a direct comparison within the same um, cultivar or variety. So even though there are standards that are out there when we do these, this type of testing, it's always ideal to have the exact cultivar because they don't have that data for every single cultivar that's out there or variety. The picture on the right is showing um, kind of our pathologist's worst nightmare, which is leaves that have been submitted from an arborvitae with a wet paper towel in there. So wet paper towel, um, can just encourage fungal development, um, sometimes of secondary things, and it really degrades the tissue. And so then we're not able to look very closely um, at, those, at those symptoms in that situation. So you want to avoid that. Um, and it does, it does say things like that on our website when you're looking at how should I collect my sample. When it comes to packaging your sample, I told you that we want the entire plant. But this picture on the left is showing um, their plants from a greenhouse in media.
but the media and the plants are all mixed together in this bag. So the foliage is getting very dirty um, and, and it's gonna have a rough life surviving the, the male like that. The picture on the right is showing uh, a peony, but this could be any type of plant, any type of uh, beans or corn or anything. And the roots are in a pot and then they have a plastic bag around that pot and around the base of the plant. And it's tied up at the base of the peony so that it's keeping that soil or that media away from the foliage. And that is very helpful to keep it clean. We want these plants to look as close to what they looked like to you in the field as they do when they get to us. Sometimes that's not possible, um, but you gotta try your best. Uh, storing it in a hot truck for two days is not going to be helpful, a representative of what you're seeing in the field. Um, and it also comes back to why it's important that we have field photos too, so that we know if some of the things that catch our attention are due to um, injury during transport, or if it really looked that way when you collected it. Uh, another set of pictures I have here, uh, again, things that kind of uh, make us laugh and end up making our Twitter page. On the left, we have our pathologist, Jan Burns, standing next to two arborvitaes, because we say more is always better when it comes to samples, and we do get full-size trees sometimes. Um, so these arborvitaes, they have the whole plant, they have the root ball. Um, this is a great sample because we can look at everything on this plant compared to what she's holding in her other hand, which is this very small segment of a tree branch. Um, and there's very little that we can do with that. And so um, we have kind of one extreme to the other, but when you're collecting them, um, not only more of the plant is better, but um, also if you, if you can sample several plants, that is ideal as well. So now we'll talk briefly about insect and arthropod samples. If you're actually sending in the insect itself, um, there are things that you need to do as far as collecting those samples and preserving the insect um, or the arthropods so that Howard can look at it. He suggests having a leak proof vial that you can fill with alcohol or vinegar and putting um, the insects in there and submitting them that way. Um, if they're larval stages, there are other things that you can do um, to help preserve the larvae as, as it looks. Um, and then if it's moths or butterflies, he recommends freezing them um, prior to shipping them um, to help preserve what they look like. Again, all of these things are listed on our website. Um, the final type of sample I'll, I'll talk about today is the uh, root nematodes. If you're sending us this basically roots and soil, um, collecting the roots and soil and placing them in labeled plastic bags is helpful. We're looking for a pint to a quart of soil. Um, you do not want to pack them in your typical paper bag because the paper bags break down from the soil moisture. Um, also for the nematodes, you don't want to expose these to uh, high temperatures. So you don't want to fill those plastic bags and then put them under your tonneau cover of your truck um, where they're going to get baked. How long does it take for uh, you to get results from the diagnostic lab? That's one of our number one questions. It really depends on the sample type, the analyses needed, um, and also the sample load that's in the lab at the time. So there's no one concrete answer. We work uh, as fast as we can to get those results back to you, especially when we know there's still time for decisions to be made about management. Um, and I told you we have a lot of uh, digital samples that come in, but our physical samples are our priority. Um, and so if you're sending that in, we are gonna be working on it as quickly as we can. How are the results communicated to you? Um, our new policy is that they will be emailed to you unless you otherwise specify that on the form. There is a checkbox. If you need to receive a hard copy, we can do that. Um, but we no longer um, mail them out through snail mail by default. You will get a uh, report that may or may not have attachments depending on what was done to it. It'll list at the top our official diagnoses, and then it will have some text that further describes those diagnoses, what we looked at, what we based it on, um, and, and sometimes there are uh, management recommendations if it's appropriate. Um, here I'm showing the form on the left or the, the results report that you would get. And then I'm also showing um, an example of a nutri tissue nutrient analysis if we have forwarded that sample on to Great ANL Great Lakes, 
um, then we include that with you as well. So you have all the information we're using to make our diagnoses. How much does it cost for a diagnostic sample and when do I pay? Um, it really varies based on what you're doing. A lot of our identifications for plants and insects are free, um, particularly if they are digital samples for plants. If you send them in, there's a $10 fee. If Howard needs to key it out, there's a $20 fee. Our general plant health analysis starts at $20 for in-state submissions, um, but there are add-on services if we need to send it out for nutrient analysis or there's uh, virus or molecular testing that is warranted. The nematode analyses start out at $25 for our basic analysis and go up from there if you need to know about the composition of the nematodes. And then herbicide screening is $90. All of these uh, invoices are sent after you have received the report. Those will also be sent via email unless otherwise specified. If you are not from the state of Michigan or if the sample comes from outside of the state of Michigan, um, many of these prices that I have up here are uh, doubled to help put emphasize our priority in serving our Michigan clients. Um, but not to discourage out-of-state samples. We do get many of those as well. We have a couple of sponsored programs I will touch on very briefly because I know I'm running out of time um, from the Michigan Wheat Program and the Michigan Soybean Committee. The Michigan Wheat Program has been sponsoring wheat samples since around 2013. And so wheat samples that come in are completely covered by uh, that program uh, for the general health analysis and any other of the add-on services that are needed. You can find out more on their website under the farmer perks section. Um, and shipping would not be covered by them if you have to send it in, but once it is here, all of the other services are. And you can also read about things we've diagnosed with the wheat program in the past on their website under their diagnostic section. The Michigan Soybean Committee supports two types of samples. The first is the soybean cyst nematode analysis that started in 1996 and we've handled more than 25,000 samples through this program since it started. Um, the instructions and the form for that are on both the Michigan Soybean Committee website as well as our plant diagnostic website. In addition, they have also been sponsoring herbicide resistance screening in weeds through the use of bioassays since 2000. We've looked at hundreds of samples since then. There are particular species that they sponsor that are in a soybean rotation, including the pigweeds, ragweeds, horseweed or mare's tail, and common lamb squirters. Again, those forms are on their website as well as our diagnostic website. And with that, I just sign off saying that we are here for you um, and I will be on after we hear from Jeff if you have any questions. So thank you very much. And I will stop sharing my screen so I can turn it over to Jeff. So we'll hop into the questions here. Please put your questions into the chat and we will address them. Um, so I know you addressed this, Erin, in the chat, but if you could summarize, Nancy asked, why does paperwork ask about children on the farm? Okay, so the form for the diagnostic lab, if you look under the insect and arthropod section, it does have a, a checkbox about asking if there are children there. This is really, I believe, related to insects found within and around the home. Um, if Howard is gonna be making a recommendation about treatment of these areas, then that could be important. And also for certain things, we do see that children are the sources of said insects like lice and things like that. And so um, I believe that's what that's asking about. If you're submitting a field sample, that's not really an important component and it's only requested if you're submitting um, an insect or arthropod sample. Eight. <clears throat> Robert asks, planting soybeans post the last rain um, Friday into moist soils, so beans should emerge without rain and weeds for sure, but with no rain in a long-term forecast, if applying fierce herbicide is the risk for soybean injury higher when the rain arrives if beans are emerged, would it be better to add a residual like dual in the first post spray? 
Okay, so usually I would defer, and I didn't mention this in my talk, but one of the really nice things is that oh, even though we have so many years of expertise, we also have um, experts in specific areas on campus that we can turn to when we have questions. And so my person I would go to to ask this question would be Christy Sprague, and she was on the call, and I believe she got kicked out. She's on her way to a research site this morning. Um, so I wanted to confirm with her some of my thoughts on that. So I text her and um, she said that if the rain comes after the beans are out of the ground, depends on how much splash that we're getting onto the foliage and to the stems of those plants that we have the potential to see injury, um, but it's not likely. I think from my point of view, we're more likely to see injury from pre's when we have um, like cool wet weather, um, where we have uh, plants that are germinating and herbicides leaching down when they're at a more sensitive stage. Um, the other part of that question was about would they be better off to apply dual in their post treatment instead of using the pre right now. Um, and Christy's comment on that is that you could do that, but you need to make sure that you're not applying dual and valor together. Great. All right. James asked, James, sorry asks, and I think this is directed to you, Jeff, which weather app do you recommend for the best weather data? Right. It's, and that's a, that's a, I use a, a, probably like most of you, I use a mix, but I will say that the, the vast majority of the materials that I use come from uh, NOAA and the National Weather Service, particularly weather.gov. And uh, some of it, it well, it's, it, I, I see my opinion, it's the most consistent and, and it's where most of this information originates. So at least the, it's, it's not exactly an app, but uh, weather.gov is, is, is the main sort of uh, entry site into, there's, it, it's very, very comprehensive. And that, that's, that's what I use most. So this isn't a question, but I do want to point everyone's attention. Mike did share an article about planting soybeans into dry soil conditions. So if you are um, worried about that and uh, worried about planting beans soon, I would check that out. Jim asks, and I think this is also directed to you, Jeff, how is this pattern that we're seeing now um, similar or different than 1988? Oh, Excellent question, Jim. Uh, and Jim, Jim remembers. Uh, I do as well. Uh, yeah, me and, too. Uh, many of and some of you do. Uh, and and again, 1988 is is one of those years indelible on most people's memory. It was it was arguably the worst drought or the most intense drought uh, across certainly across Michigan in in the last at least half century. Uh, hopefully, we won't see one again like that. Now, that said, there is one similarity with this year. And that is that both 88 and, and the current year are years that we had drought that are early on, sort of early onset in the season and uh, versus a mid and late season type of drought. That's that's the more classic one in, in the Midwest where we say, and it, and it corresponds with sensitive crop stages, et cetera. But 88 was an early one, but some very, very significant and real differences between that year and this year. And the one is 1988 was preceded by an unusually mild and dry winter. And we, we came into the season with very, very little moisture in reserve and it just continued. And then during 88, the peak month of dryness actually was, it turned out to be May. There were some areas in Michigan that did not get precip the whole month of May. That's, that's, and that's, that's off the charts. Very, very, very unusual. So I, the conditions in 88, at least at this point, were, well, and they were, they were much, they were much, much worse already at that time than they are this year. And again, all we, we need is a, is a big jet stream change here and we'll see something different but uh it, it both of those were early onset the, the other one that comes to mind historically you got to go way back to the depression to 1934 that's another classic early drought and and those those have special problems associated with them that we don't see the years where the droughts where we get in say july or august uh that that's more common so there are, are a couple things in common with 88 but but there's some that are very very different Love that historical uh, context. That's really great. So Clay asks, are we experiencing anything from the California fires? If so, what? We are, well, I think as most people probably have uh, have witnessed here over the last couple of weeks, 
there there are actually the, there are a large number of fires wildfires and forest fires ongoing right now most of them though are north of the border in Canada particularly Alberta British Columbia Saskatchewan there's even a couple in Ontario and because of the upper airflow that you saw we, we showed you uh, images of here uh some of the and, and there there are large numbers of fire and you can ask well why why are there so many fires it's because it's been really really abnormally warm and dry uh, so the early early start to the fire so wildfire season there but some of the smoke from those fires of course is being moved in the lower part of the troposphere the lowest 20 25,000 feet of the atmosphere uh to the south and east over over the U.S. and we're we're basically just downwind or downstream and that's what accounts for some of these really strange uh hazy days uh it's it's actually smoke and it some of the layer it's up around 20 25,000 feet it depends on the day but it's been been up there where there's stronger winds and and again it's 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 got to come a long way the smoke to make it here but it does and the other thing we see are vivid uh sort of colorful sunrises and sunsets as as the sun the light has to pass through all of those layers and so that's that's why we get the the color so that's that's been something that we've been dealing with for the last few weeks um uh, but that would that would be the primary impact a little bit of it by the way we've seen a, we can measure a little bit of a reduction in solar radiation from that it's not large but it's enough there's enough uh, particulate matter up there with the smoke to actually re reflect a little bit of that solar out that would have been there otherwise yeah and i'm realizing that claire was probably referring to the canadian fires all along and i just read that <laughs> yeah but um i will open this up we'll go back to questions if we have time but if spe any specialists have updates um real quick and we'll go back to questions okay um we'll go back to oh yes Lyndon. oh uh, yeah um irrigation's a hot topic for the people that have irrigation uh, a few people have asked thinking about adding it now it's a little hard this late in the season to add irrigation but if you have it you ought to be thinking about using it or using it a lot of it's running now I put some recommendations in there but in general a half an inch incorporates herbicides uh, helps germinate reduces uh crusting and keeps us on track and um, that's more than what a crop a newly emerged crop will use in a week so half an inch is a good idea if you have a producer that's planted seed into soil that's dry because of tillage uh, practices or uh, an aggressive cover crop that wasn't terminated or hasn't had a rain since it was terminated then those soils are really dry down deep and uh, one inch applications are probably needed to keep that moisture ahead of the seed that's germinating uh, growing down for it so we need to keep the water moving down below where the seeds thinking it's going to find it down below it. Uh, there's references to this material in the chat. Great, thanks, Lyndon. I will go back to questions. So Eric asks the logistic questions. Um, if people submit photos or ID through ASIC extension, do those get forwarded to the diagnostic lab? When should ASIC extension be used and when should people go directly to the diagnostic lab? So that's a good question. Um, so the ask extension um, questions are are sort of delegated by some handlers behind the scenes. And a lot of those are some of our consumer horticulture um, extension educators. And they say, oh, this is a weeds question. We're going to send it to Aaron or Angie or whomever. Um, and so it, some of those come our way, but not all of them. Um, and some of the members of our lab don't participate in ASK extension because from our logistic standpoint, it's something extra um, and we have to be handling the physical samples. So, um, for example, we don't answer any pathology questions through ASK extension. And so um, if you know that you have a particular uh, question that is uh, applicable to a commercial level agriculture, I would suggest you just contact the lab directly because you're going to probably get a faster response from us. The lab does have a general email address, which is pestid at msu.edu. And then um, Jackie um, sends those to whomever needs to answer those. So I would say for a faster response, it's nice to email the lab directly. For a more general residential type questions, ask extension is very helpful because we have all these people who can answer them um, and help kind of uh, us manage the load of questions. 
Good to know. Okay, I believe this was addressed, but in case you have anything else to add, Jeff, Eric asks, is there a good website with solar radiance forecast for the coming week? <laughs> That's an interesting one. And I, I just uh, tried to respond on his, on his chat. For the forecast of solar, I, I, off the top, I do not know. It's it's a it's not something done very often, but I think that one does exist. It's it's for the solar energy uh, sector. I'll have a look, but right now I don't. I, I, unfortunately, I, I, there's a lot of forecasts for a lot of things, but I don't I don't know one for that. But I'll I'll look. I I, I suspect it won't exist. Great. Um, okay, so you just uh, addressed Phil's question about a good database for toxic weeds. In Michigan, I also was wondering where we can find information on the herbicide resistant weeds that you guys keep track of. Oh, that's a good question. Thanks, Christine. So well, we do keep track on the county level of any herbicide resistant cases we have found, and that's um, a part of our website. So if you go to pesticide.msu.edu, you'll find um, a whole map about herbicide resistance, and you can click on your county and see which species have been confirmed to be resistant, um, what they were resistant to, and, and what year that was confirmed. So you can get an idea in your area what things we have already confirmed, and that's something that we add to every year. Um, there's also an international database that does get down to the state level, um, and that's weedscience.org, and I'll try and drop that in the chat as well. Uh, but we're the only state I know of that has any type of resistance information down to the county level. That's great. Um, I do want to check in. Chris, did you want to share any information about flights and counts? No, it's just been very, very low. You know, when you get really low humidity and low um, low amounts of moisture, uh, lady moths need water to make eggs. So, you know, if it gets really dry, then that could affect some of the some of the egg laying of some of these species. But it's been pretty quiet. A little bit of elf alfalfa weevil and a call about grubs or two, and that's been about it. Okay. And again, if you're not looking, there's all sorts of resources being shared in the chat, so I would check there um, for sure. I have one more question to ask, and um, I just want to know, Erin, what apps for diagnostics are helpful when are apps not going to be as useful as just sending it to the diagnostic lab? You know, where should we be cautious and where can we um, use some good tools? So I don't know that our lab has really assessed apps for anything more than plant identification. So I've, I've done an assessment of the smartphone apps um, for the class that I teach. Um, and so I think there are some really good ones out there, and I have an article about that. Um, some of the top ones have been uh, Picture This, uh, Plant Snap, uh, there's Plant Story, there's a couple other ones that seem to do well. But in the article, which I'll share, it talks about the percentage of time that they're accurate. I think they're most helpful if your brain is just kind of foggy and you're like, I think I know what this plant is, but I can't remember what it is, because if it pops up something that you're like, ah, yes, I remember that. I think that it's helpful. If it suggests something that you've never heard of before, um, that's when you need to be more skeptical, ask questions, check other um, data to see if it even occurs in our area, and then maybe rely on some of the expertise we have through Extension or the Diagnostic Lab. But as far as using apps to um, identify diseases, um, insects, uh, nematodes, those, we haven't assessed any of that at this point. So I'd be cautious. This is, this is Chris again, talking about insects. If you're going to take pictures of insects and send them in, uh, a little bit further back and in focus is better than really close and, and, you know, then it's all blurry. And another thing is, I mean, if you really want to know, stick the insect in the refrigerator or the freezer for a few minutes and it'll stop. And then you can take a picture of it. I know that's not convenient if you're in the field, but if you do have something, even if it's dead, usually I can figure it out if it's in focus and I can zoom in on it. And if I can't, then we just go to Howard. <laughs> <laughs> then we can pretty quickly identify stuff. I think that's a great point that we don't have any special software to make your bad pictures look better. And we cannot zoom in if you send us low quality, low resolution photos. So um, thanks for bringing that up, Chris, because we do get a lot of um, 
insufficient photos that we have to ask for new ones for. Great. Now, if there's no more um, comments, we'll close out here. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and week.